Welcome to Positive Filter with your host, Fuller Wilkerson, a podcast that focuses on friends, family, health, and career with a little self-help along the way. Please join me in this journey for self-improvement, and I hope what I have to share will make you a better person, thus making the world a better place. I hope you enjoy the show. I hope you enjoy the show. I hope you enjoy the show. Hello, people of the world. It's Philip Wilkerson back with another episode of Positive Filter. I'm joined by a special guest. I'm joined by Dean Artis. Now, you know, I'm on a, a, a rampage. I'm doing a, what I like to call the Dean mini series, where I've gotten a chance to learn from the various deans of George Mason University about their career journey, the uniqueness about their schools and colleges, and just asking questions as you know, someone that's very interested in higher education as a whole. So before we get started, Dean Artis, you know, just give a little background on who you are. Thank you, Philip. Um, so I'm Ann Artis. I have been at Mason for a little over five years. This is almost the beginning of my, gosh, sixth year, I guess, okay. um, and came in the fall of 18 and have survived COVID. Yes. It's yes. been a complicated journey here in ways that I don't think any of us anticipated. Um, I'm, like, amazed to think about uh, when I got here, faculty were very, we're going to teach in person. Yeah. We we're going to teach in person. And then people had to figure out, we were just talking about learning skills. People yeah. had to figure out how to teach online mm-hmm. and and then to teach well in hybrid settings and to do all of this kind of new stuff. Um, so, you know, I'm old enough to imagine that the goal of life is to keep learning. Yes, yes yeah. <laughs> and you can't anticipate what you're going to need to learn, but you need to be ready to understand context and kind of think through problem setting. Not okay. not just problem solving, but problem setting. Um, but life is going to always throw stuff at us that we can't anticipate. Um, so... That's it. That's real life. So you are you are the dean of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences. Um, you know, it's a mouthful. We call it chess for short. But your educational background, what did you study in undergrad and grad and, I guess, doctoral program? So I'll start with, like, true story. Um, yeah. I, I wandered toward a major. Um, oh, yes, I, I had spent um, a summer in Morocco as a high school student, as an AFS student, and went to college, like the, all of the women in my parents' generation were nurses and teachers. Mm -hmm. And I went to college thinking I would be a nurse because I wanted to go into the Peace Corps and I wanted Mm -hmm. to go back to Africa. I studied Arabic. I studied art history. I had, as I look back now, I had amazing high school humanities teachers. Mm -hmm. I had not great science teachers. Okay. So when I think about why I've you know, sort of gravitated toward these things. It's partly, I'm sure, because of the amazing teachers in my background. Um, But I went to college telling my parents I would be a nurse. Mm -hmm. Um, And eventually I got around to telling them that I was going to be an English major. All right, okay. (laughs) Uh, But that took a while, and it was a kind of a, you want to do what? (laughs) Yeah. And again, you know, um, I'm 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 from families that came to this country in the 19th century, fleeing religious persecution, looking for opportunity, you know, lots of farmers and day laborers in my family's history. Um, I've been thinking about this a lot lately. My parents, my mom is 94 now, right? Um, She was um, a teenager during World War II. And both of my parents had the benefit of the expansion of higher education post-World War II. That's right, with the GI Bill and all that, right? Exactly. You know, her older brother served in Italy, but she was a a kid Mm -hmm. who watched of the 10 kids on the block, two didn't come home. Um, Mm. And so that sense of being shaped by the experience of World War II, um, but also that sense of we're going to, you know, she was born in 1929, right? Yeah. But we're going to survive, but we're going to survive by being incredibly cost-sensitive and... And, and hard working. And hard working, and we're going to be practical. That's the other part yeah, of it. That's, right? I, was, I was really about to get to that part because what, what I'm hearing, too, is like English, that doesn't directly translate to a job. They're like nursing. You're going to be a nurse. So, yeah, can you, yes, let's, let's dive into that. Like you're, you're coming home and bringing nursing, um, English. So English and then political science. Um, and I picked up a second major because I thought it would make me a better candidate for a junior year abroad experience. Yeah. 
kind of dumb idea, right? But that's why I, I ended up with a double major. Um, and graduated Phi Beta Kappa, you know, my, my, the person I lived with, uh, my, my roommate for three years was the head of the class, um, Mm -hmm. and went off to do a PhD in philosophy at Harvard, was told that, um, she ended up doing law school at Stanford, and then she, uh, I, I saw her again decades later when she, um, did a, a, a case at the Supreme Court, um, but, you know, it was like, she her parents wanted her to be a math major. Right. She was a philosophy major. Um, we bond, we both were a uh, public education institution, higher ed. And when I think about my first year in college, it was nine students and three faculty members in an interdisciplinary 19th century studies course. Okay, small class. Hello, nine people, three yeah. faculty members. Um, it was an amazing experience, um, and and it gave me the kind of, you can do this, mm. which I certainly didn't get kind of growing up, right? Got it. Um, but again, uh, lots of lots of positive, I never felt not loved by my family, yeah. but they were just mystified by some why someone would want to do English, in English or yeah. political science, yeah. and then a PhD, right? Um, but, you know, kind of thinking now, my what was your first job after college? Me? Yeah. Working at a school with children with special needs. My first job after college was creosoting fences um, mm. at a friend's grandparents' place in Colorado. We we graduated, we got a free place to live, and we did whatever needed to be done on that space in the mountains, um, which included fences, fence creosoting, cleaning out a mine, doing a lot of like labor, you know, labor, like hard labor. Um, and my second job out of college, college, you're probably too young to remember what this is. Um, was this a Kelly girl? Do you remember you gotta, what those are? It's like a temp service. I remember temps. I know what temps are. It's kind of like, uh, what's it called? Um, Mary, what's it called? Um, Mary Tyler Moore? Yeah. Yeah. You so know, like kind of like the, the, the you, know, you just, just do going whatever. Into the office. You're, yeah. in a, you know, you're playing secretary. Um, yeah. So my, for my second job right after college, we moved to Philadelphia. I moved with a friend and I landed in a set of temp secretarial stuff. Um, and I will still remember, like, you know, I can't do accents well, but um, the Kelly placement officer was like, Doll, why did you go to college? Mm-hmm. I could have gotten you a job straight out of high school. So, you know. Thank you. Wait, Thanks wait, a lot. I, I was really proud of my GPA. I worked really hard as a student. I, yeah. you know. But, but um, that first like, office job um, opened a door for me as a cancer research journal wow. editorial assistant. So my to first... Write, to use your writing. Yep, yep. So my first, like, actual full-time, not three weeks here, four weeks there, um, was in a cancer research journal at, at Temple. Um, and, again, at a point in my life where I was just having fun living in a big city and yeah. not being a student and trying to think through what I wanted to do next... Um, it was pretty amazing. It was also like, oh my gosh, I can read sentences really well. I was about to say, yeah. These scientists writing sentences that I can't understand, do I want to do this? (laughs) Right. Uh, So did it click? So did it click in that first job, the first writing job, the researcher, did it click that, oh yeah, I got an English degree. I'm using my English degree. It did, but it also made me think, you know what? I don't want to do this forever. (laughs) Okay, yeah. Um, Yeah. And, um... That's when I went to graduate school. And what was for? What was for graduate school? English PhD. So you're just keeping on going. Yeah, but I tutored engineering students as a graduate student in English. Yeah. I taught a lot of composition classes, but I worked for a sociology faculty member who was doing a, a study for the city that the university mm. was in on disability services in the local population or for the local population. So I had experiences being a ghostwriter. Um, so, I had experience being a research assistant for a faculty member. Um, I tutored a lot of writing students. I had a multi-year job at one point um, doing copy editing for a law firm. You yeah. know, So all these versions yeah, of uh, yeah. applied uses of writing. Um, but I, you know... You were just living life. I was, was like, just... You yeah. wanted to make sure you had a paycheck. You wanted to make sure you had a roof over your head and you, you were hardworking, and I was multiple really, jobs. Yeah, and I was really interested in ways that I 
probably didn't tell my family in research. Um, oh, okay. So, you know, kind of seven years later, I get an AAUW dissertation completion fellowship, which for my family was like, oh, you can make money doing this. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. then a first job as an academic is like, oh, you can make money doing this. Yeah. Like, but as I said to the crowd at uh, graduation last week, I never had any idea at 22 what I'd be doing now. No. You know, I just, there was, there, it's not been an obvious straight path. Life is never an obvious straight path, no. but the pressures that young people can feel to be like successful in certain stereotypical ways, um, that can be really, that can be real. <laughs> yeah. It can feel very burdensome. So, um, like I, when I think about the value of a liberal arts education, yeah, I was about to say. Yeah, it's really so much about learning to be a researcher, okay, learning how to communicate really well, um, but to talk in different voices depending on what an audience yeah. needs, right? Um, and kind of making sure um, that you're talking to people, not talking down to people. That mm. matters a lot to me. Yeah, like, you know? like the message, like if you're a history person, right, you're you're providing context, but you're not doing it in a kind of, like, of course you should know these things, right? Exactly. That's, I'm thinking about that as a history, when I was, like, I love history, and I love to talk about it with other people, but I could see that if I felt like I have all this resources and reading, and I'm trying to explain something historical to someone else, if I come off with a a tone of condescension, it's going to turn them off. Yep. So th- I think that's what I'm tracking with you. Yeah, and that, that kind of, um, there, there's a lot of anti-intellectualism in this country, right? Yeah. Um, and in some contexts, higher education has earned its negative mm-hmm. perception because it can be condescending. It can be, I'm smarter than you, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but at its best, higher education is opening doors for people engaging people helping people understand the present because they understand the complexity Mm -hmm. of history Mm -hmm. and the complexity of there are going to be a zillion different perspectives on any given issue how do you sift through and make distinctions between information evidence-based information versus misinformation or disinformation yeah. you know that kind of life life is not simple no <laughs> human history has not been simple you know there's plenty of stuff that human beings have done to this planet that has not been good <laughs> for the yeah. planet or yeah. for people but but thinking about learning mm-hmm. and and modeling learning as something that's available to everyone yeah. as opposed to something that yeah only the elite that, yep, yeah only the elite that blocks people out yeah. that I care about that a lot and I know that I like at this point in my life um I again as an 18 year old I couldn't tell my parents I couldn't articulate what I was really interested in but I certainly couldn't have told them that I wanted to be anything but a nurse not right. that that had even occurred to me yet but I was going to either be a teacher or a nurse. That was just like, you know, what women could do right? <laughs> in the context of a lot of family history. That was where being a nurse or a teacher was a step up from being a farmer, That's right. a day laborer, you know, all the things that brought my family in different ways to this country. It was It was not about privilege. It was about getting yourself out of something else yeah. and finding opportunity. So uh, one of the just, you know, one of the things I love about Mason is that Mason is the world in that way. People are coming to this place for an education because they can afford it. We are a better yeah, accessible more affordable. I mean access to excellence, right? You know, exactly. accessibility and exactly. we also understand that and you're saying it very well is that education is the the way to advance someone's social mobility and it's about family social mobility yeah. it's not just the individual yeah. it's about what you know oh, you what can it. i do 
for the next generation because of the opportunities that education has given me. I mean, you can flat out see that in graduation. See how many families come? Oh my gosh. And they're like, like the random cousin made it for all of us. You know what I'm saying? They're like, that's elevating everyone either, you know, as a lateral person, someone can see their peer like, oh, that's my cousin. I can go to college too. Also, the parents are very proud, right? Like, it's totally- they got a career now to help them. And then you said that generational thing, like now they're, you know, they're setting the tone that their children might are not going to yep. be first gen. Now, one of the things I, I, that struck me very particular is that uh, the overwhelming pressure of society to have degrees that are professionally mm-hmm. professional degrees, and you're, the way you're making us out, I think this has been a higher ed issue for multiple years. Do you feel like it's gotten worse? You know, with you know, in regards to selling, you know, ch- the humanities here at Chess, or do you? Th- it's just different. You know, for me. Um, and, you know, just kind of when I studied, I, I, I started off as a business major when I was in undergrad because I thought, OK, you go to college, you get a business degree to get a job with money. Yep. And I hated it. Like I didn't like the classes. And then I took one history class and I was like, I don't care what the career outcome is. I just know I like this history major yeah. and I'll I'll make it work. I'll explain it to my dad later. And then my dad couldn't tell me nothing because he went through three majors and he was a history major, too. So I was like. We can, you know, I took history, um, but I still felt that that pressure yeah. of, of saying, OK, uh, doctor, lawyer, bust or um, yep. I got to explain it. Maybe I'll go to law school. I heard history majors go to law school. I was trying to figure it out. I had no clue what I was doing. I just knew that I would study something I liked. Mm-hmm. Thus, I know at least I get good grades. But that pressure was there. But what about now? What do you think is going on? I think it's still going on. Yeah. And maybe it's flavored differently because yeah. of what's going on in our country right now. Um, yeah. But but I think the, the the point of similarity generationally is is there. It's mm-hmm. real. Um, and you know, as a as a parent, I can now say, oh, I I understand better now what my parents were worried about, yeah. what my grandmother was worried about. Mm-hmm. And that was like, at some point, we want this kid off of the payroll, right? Yeah, <laughs> you know, we yeah. want this kid being financially independent. We want this kid happy with what they're doing and not feeling um, like they're drawn down by and burdened by student debt, yeah. right? I'm incredibly lucky to have, like, my tuition at a public state institution was $250 a semester. You know, it was, yeah. it was just so darn reasonable at that point in time, right? My parents were like, "You, I'm one of four. You can go wherever you want in state, wherever we happen to be living. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. it's in state, right? Um, and and I, there were all, all kinds of good choices that that all yeah. of my siblings made in that regard. Um, but when I look at what's played out more recently, the cost of higher education. Yeah. Um, you know, there are now institutions where a four year degree is over a hundred thousand dollars a year in tuition. Yeah. That's not full cost of attendance. That's just tuition. Yeah. Um that's pretty darn scary. I remember a faculty member that I worked with in graduate school had a daughter who went to a liberal arts college, um, but got a degree in social work. And when okay. I saw her a number when I saw the mom a number of years later, um, to hear her talking about the way in which her daughter was still like she was going to be carrying the burden of her college tuition debt yeah. for decades, right? Um, but loves being a social worker. So it's mm. that sense of, you know, how do you do that sort of juggling act for yourself, for your extended family, for your kids? Um, you made a really important point, Philip. It's like when I often think about like advising, how do we help students think about like what do they actually what are they good at? Yeah. What do they love? And where's the sweet spot? You yeah. know, where where's where's where do they intersect? But two, again, life is not a straight yeah. line journey. So yeah. there are so many ways in which things that you end up knowing because you got a four year liberal arts degree yeah. somehow help you understand or see a way forward. In ways that you can't anticipate, but that yeah. are that are just real, you know. Reading a room, reading people's like having emotional intelligence, um, 
I'm an English major. Like poetry is not a luxury, right? I mean, yeah. you you learn things yeah. by learning how to craft words and, and see a life yeah. through someone else's shoes, right? That sense of how you develop empathy, how you develop historical understanding, mm-hmm. even through reading fiction and poetry. Um, you know, I I will I will never not <laughs> um, you know see value in those ways of knowing the world because of the way in which they force you out of your own personal experience, right? Yeah. You know, you're reading something written from somebody else's perspective and you you have to now. yeah, and you're and you're you're having an inside rather than an outsider's view of some version of life experience. Does that make sense? Yeah, but the only pro I mean not the only problem and I'm saying I feel like there is less wiggle room to explore now. Like, I, I mean, I, I mean, like I can, I can say I was the quintessential floater, you know, you know, uh, as long as I didn't spend too, you know, waste my dad's money too much or yeah. I figured it out. I worked, you know, uh, my dad was cool with me switching my major yep. as long as I brought good grades home, you yep. know, and I could justify the grades. But I feel like we're already like, if you go back, like look at Fairfax County, which is probably one of the, most affluent counties, but also one of the most serious academic clowns. We got eighth graders saying, what do you want to be when you grow up? Yeah. And so where is that exploration? You know, like colleges where you explore, like they got to come in and freshmen, you, like I'm just thinking like how we talk to freshmen. You come in as a freshman, all right, uh, get two internships, and by the time you should know your career plan. And I, I don't know. I, I think I want to like still, it's almost like paradoxical. I want people to be like, come to college, you know, don't be in crazy debt, but like, fig- like play around with different classes, see what you yeah. like, see what you rock with. Uh, we we should still value some exploration. I totally agree with you, but I also think that we need to push the storytelling earlier because, okay. like, what does it look like when middle schoolers and high schoolers have a chance to hear the career stories of people mm-hmm. that studied history <laughs> yeah. well it, yeah. whatever you know yeah. it's that that kind of I uh, and again I you know I, I think there's it's it's so often driven by love but that sense of you want your kid to be mm-hmm. successful right, right. It's fear. Um, but right but then there's if you if you step outside if you create context in school settings for youngsters to have a sense of mm-hmm. oh I can do that with my life yep um that's that pushes people out of and like in my family it was women as teachers and nurses yep. and all of the guys were expected to go to law school med school or yeah. some or, you know or Doc, be engineers it doctor was like, lawyer it, bust it, yeah. yeah it was it was <laughs> it was those three things right but that but like how do you um, the world of work is incredibly yeah. diverse across yeah. sectors right and how do you, I just had lunch today with a Mason alum. You, generationally, again, I think my parents' generation, mm-hmm. those that worked, they worked in one mm-hmm. job, one company, yeah. the whole of their career. Yep. That's not what career experience is mm-hmm. these days, right? So how do we prepare to keep learning? Mm-hmm. And then how do you, when when do you know is the right time to leave a job right to leave a job sector to industry come sector. back yeah. for yeah to come back for retraining to yeah. circle back and pick up x kind of skill we're in this i think as i my kids are 27 and 30 and mm-hmm. um for my son in high school um very different experience than my daughter just but they were they were doing Khan academy stuff as yes. their homework yeah, right yeah. and then physics lab was Every classroom was just a lab. There was mm-hmm. no book learning mm-hmm. in the classroom. Um, so I think that kind of like free range learning yep. in a digital age has been happening mm-hmm. for longer than we typically talk about it. Yeah. Um, and he's the kid in my family who was like, "Mom, you're taking this job as a dean. You should take." And then he would he rattled off this summer before I came here. It's like you should take this Coursera course and this course. And I'm like, Alex. How do you even know about Coursera, right? Yeah. But um, again, you know, in college, he 
he needed to do, he was given an opportunity to work on a big like hospital system research project. Um, they were trying to figure out recidivism, patient recidivism rates, mm-hmm. right? He had a summer um, research experience in a hospital that he'd been hospitalized in as right. a high school student, right? So it was complex history for him. But he got online and figured out how to do computer programming. I wouldn't. Taught himself. Uh, he the upskill, taught himself. The, the upskilling. With, yeah. yeah, the upskilling because there is really good digital learning that's available. available. Mm-hmm. Um, and and again, that way of thinking about what am I going to need to get credentialed in mm-hmm. that I can do free of cost mm-hmm. versus when do I need to go get some other version of credentialing that involves a tuition cost. Mm-hmm. That's a range of options that wasn't available to me way back when. Gotcha. You know? But then thinking about how do we help students at Mason think about exactly that sort of what do you what what are the advantages of studying something with a cohort of students and a faculty member in a classroom or you know in an online classroom and in a hybrid you know sort of whatever version of mm-hmm. legality it is um, and then when is it possible because you're driven enough to do it you've got the self motivation to go find additional some resources. version of additional training um that you can get without um, either without or with a minimal kind of um, tuition cost. Those are um, those are I think Im- those are important ways to have agency now right. as a student. And you know I I'm too old to have that kind of opportunity as a 25 year old or 26 year old. It's still upskill, you know? man. You still can do the Corsairs too, right now. Yeah. Now, yeah. Uh, my thought. This is another thought I had too. Is that I think I'm going to go on a Chess is very large because of the, the diversity of majors, right? It's it's a you know, I think we're like a, a, we because I'm counting myself as a PhD yes, student. Yes. So y'all y'all can claim me for now, you know what I'm saying? PhD and calm. But um one of the things I'm thinking about is that there's gonna be a, a large there's gonna be an enrollment cliff, right? Um and so Mason is really looking at the different ways to still um encourage non-contemporary people to learn, right? Yep. People coming back. Now, what I think about, when I think about upskilling and uh, people coming back, you think I'm doing like these little quick boot camps on coding and stuff. Where is the space where the liberal arts can get involved in that non, not the contemporary students coming back? That's you know what I'm saying? saying? Like, you know, yeah. Where, where can they yeah. jump into that space? That's a great question. Thank you for that. But a couple of things first. You know, I, I think the the profile... Like every new class at Mason, college to college, school to school, is different, Mm -hmm. right? For chess, about half of any first time class, like fall Mm -hmm. this next year, fall of last year, half of a typical first year class are coming straight from high school. So first time, first year students. Yep. And then half are transfers. Okay, from okay. So and it's transfer from four year liberal arts. It's transfer from four year universities. It's transfer from lots of transfers from Nova. Some of mm-hmm. those through the advanced program, mm-hmm. but some you know not officially part of the advanced program, and then from other community college systems. Um, so there's you know there's a diversity there. The enrollment cliff is different for us because we're not as dependent on high school graduation populations Mm -hmm. as some of the colleges and schools here are. Do we want that population? Of course. But but as much our bread and butter is the students transferring in from elsewhere, right? Mm -hmm. And in that case, what we're hoping to continue to do better and better is just efficiency of transfer. So getting the credits to transfer, Mm -hmm. making sure that people aren't having to repeat courses. Um, The but the other, the, the college has gotten, or it was a big project this last year, so I've gotten a lot more intentional about the re, what we call a recruit back opportunity. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, there and COVID, COVID was complicated. COVID hit our populations really, really hard. We are not in a COVID next, you know, post COVID next normal yet, right? Yeah. So we are still kind of roughed up by and weathering the 
um, the volatility in the community college space post-COVID. Yes, okay. right? community college space, okay. Um, but Chess um, did a big research project, Lisa Brelia, the Senior Associate Dean for Undergraduate Academic Affairs, and Kelly Dunn, for example, School of Integrative Studies, um, pulled together data on students who have wandered away from degree completion. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. And so it's the recruit back. Mm, uh, yep. Like and, and thinking about, and you've heard Dr. Washington talk about this, that sort of the population in the U.S. overall that started yes, but that's never a large, finished. That's it's, a, it's a very huge big Huge pocket. I know yep. there was like certain schools like, um, I don't know, it was Morehouse. Morehouse was like trying to like, come here we just take you and you'll finish like they they were trying to get those people that just need one more year to finish yep. right they're like I, i'm thinking of like people in my family one of my uncles man he you know life happened life was life and and yep. he uh joined the military yep and he just you know and had a whole career after that and he, he probably could just go back and finish and they're trying to get those people that like don't necessarily need that degree but they're doing it for a point of pride or they're so close to finishing or maybe they do still need it for Social mobility. Getting another, yeah, yeah. Yep. And that's the, the, the Bachelor of Individualized Studies for us is yeah. that other space where yep. um, it's still the, I think I'm right in saying this, the only program at the university that is very deliberately and always intentional about giving people credit yes. that's recognizing life experience. Yes. So a lot of military veterans yep. have come back to school in that way. But it's also people who... I was just thinking about it. Uh, One of my boys, he was a detective in D.C., and uh, shout out to you, Zach, and he was saying, like, he did the Bachelor's of Individualized Studies uh-huh. here because uh, it, it wasn't a requisite to have a degree to be a detective. Yep. But then, I think he's D.C., D.C. was like, to be a detective, you need to have a bachelor's degree. So they, you know, it's almost like grandfathered him, like, you better get this degree or, you know, probation. So they paid for him to come here and get it, and he did his around what his life was, criminology, yep. Yep. got his bachelor's in individual studies. And so. that's a great example, because it's exactly that sort of flexibility of what in your professional experience, your job mm-hmm. experience, your life experience, um, can be translated, obviously, into, or most easily, into college credit. Mm-hmm. Um, but then, too, like, what are the things that, while you're a student, are going to help you get where you want to go next or yeah. to get up within your current job. So that sense of the individualization is about yeah. having maximum flexibility to pack courses in this area rather than that. You know, there, there, there is a, a, tr- a traditional liberal arts degree. You've got to stretch across a number of things. Yes, yes. And the individualized studies lets you go deeper um, and, you know, kind of round out, push forward in ways that make sense for your particular interests as a student. It's a more complicated advising yes. kind of role for the staff and faculty who do that. Um, but there's a real point of pride in that recruit back success. Um, you know, those those students, they, life may have taken them, like if yeah. you were deployed, right? Yeah. Um, life may have happened, you got pregnant when you mm-hmm. didn't expect to get pregnant. Yep. And you got your kids through college, and now you're... I just saw at the, our undergraduate research symposium, somebody who's been teaching um, for a number of years, finished, you know, her kids got through school, she went back and finished in order to be able to move up as a teacher. Yep. Um, but it was about, like, she hadn't planned on getting pregnant as a sophomore in no. college way back when, and... Yeah. Life took her in a Life different direction. Life. Yeah, but then it's like, here she is, you know, doing a research presentation in our symposium that was just wicked smart. Um, yeah, I love it. Yeah. So how do, what is, uh, you know, how, how do people recruit back? Like, what, what's the tech, like, you go to, like, military retirement ceremonies? Like, how do, no, <laughs> I'm, we just, to I'm sorry, out. like, how do, yeah, yeah. how do we get these, how do we get these people to come back then? So in, in, in our case, it was just studying the data, you know, yeah. who are the people that have been in chess programs okay. who've stopped enrolling. How far back you going? The history. It was like it was like ten a ten year capture, ten year period. Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. So and then is there so the outreach? You know, a how do you find them? Right. Yeah. Um, Gotta find them. But there are 
things like LinkedIn now, and yeah, you know yeah. there are ways to you find people. You were scrubbing it and sourcing it. Yep, exactly. Mm-hmm. And then it's a question of like you know starting those conversations with people. But it but it started with who were the people that were chess students over X number yeah, of years. years of period, and how close are they to finishing? I was about to ask that question. Yeah. Like they're like to make it worth their time. You're not gonna like like you're like you know they're like I'm just throwing this out there. 120 credits to graduate, and they're like, oh, they're at 80. Maybe we can get them across the finish line, as opposed to someone's like 20, like they dropped out their freshman year. I don't know. Or just all of them. It's two different populations then, isn't it? Because yeah. if somebody, I mean, you know, nationally, but the, if you make it through your first year of college, yeah. your likelihood of finishing a college degree yep. goes way, way up. Yep. So what's happening in that first year for students? Why do they flame out? Um, yeah. and then are they ready to make different life choices, right? Um, yeah. So the strategy is different. Your your example of the somebody yeah. with barely, you know, not even a full year's worth of yeah. credits versus 80, 90, um, and then it's more typical in that 80, 90, if they've gone on to do other things, what's the complement of professional experience? What's the job experience? What's the military experience? And how does that translate into being close to no I'm just making stuff up but like yeah. a, a BIS degree with a focus on leadership studies got it you know if you've yeah. been in the military and if you've been yep. you know yeah yeah what is um, you know I know all the deans get together what are the uniqueness uh, uniqueness successes and challenges that you see when you're at the table with the other deans as it applies to chess like these are things going well for us that are different than going well for other people at the different colleges. And these are the unique challenges that we have as a college that are may not the same challenges as other colleges. Yeah. Um, this is circling back to some of what we already talked about, actually, yeah. because it's like I think there there is a way in which the humanities and the social sciences are burdened with negative optics mm-hmm. about ROI, right? You know, the whole yeah. sort of what are you going to do with that? Um just talking to a faculty member who's retiring now and she's was married to a, 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 har, a real scientist a, you know chemistry guy it's a real I mean, scientist she's, yeah, yeah. You know, this is yeah. this is a like uh, a, a very like long do they really feel like that out in the world like yes there's, like right i'm a scientist like i'm a scientist you're like i'm a doctor too and you're like i'm a real scientist like i'm well, a real her, scientist she was, too she was sharing both that the sense mm. of like what she heard from yeah. you know from um, a beloved spouse yeah um, uh, for some period in her life, and what her kids would tease her about, right? Yeah, yeah. you know. Um, so, th- I think what you see in the media more often is humanities degrees, right? What's the value of a humanities yeah. degree? Um, but I think there's a burden of of can mm-hmm. be negativity related to social science fields as well. Um, and again, it's but like the more opportunities I have to talk with and get to know Mason alum, yep. the more I hear versions of the same story which is life took me in directions that I didn't anticipate um, and there were all kinds of ways that I wouldn't have been able to tell you as an 18 year old that my degree here you know had value and opened doors for me in spite of what is going on in the media these days um, you know it's like our alum are doing just fine. I love it. They're I see the I see really the stories here on the buildings on the walls mm-hmm. with their names and the pictures, and it shows different things like, oh, this guy's a history guy, but now he's working for like the feds. You yeah. know, like you never thought like what like, the international oh. studies yeah. major who's just founded her second bank. I mean, yeah, you know, yeah. That's a how do you go from you know? Yeah, that's a weavy path, except it's not. Um, you mm-hmm. know, as I think of her story in particular. Um, she immigrated to this country as a 13-year-old without speaking English. Her mom really wanted her to get a degree. She chose to stay in the area, got her degree here. But she was the kind of undergraduate who took it upon herself to go talk to the president um, at the time and to tell him that there wasn't enough co-curricular programming for students. You know. And she, she met her husband at one of these meetings with the president about what Mason needed to be doing differently for students. Um, so no matter what your major was, she had that attitude, right? She like, did. Yeah. And, you know, she went from, she was, again, this is, I hope I have all the details right. Um, she was trying to figure out, she got offered a couple of different versions of 
just entry-level bank jobs um, straight out of college. And the story she shared with me is like there was a some small thousand dollar difference in what each of this, these two places that were on her short list. But clearly the people interviewing her didn't understand what $3,000 of difference made to her. Um, and she, she, she took to her first job what she had here as a student, which was like the presence of mind to say this could be better, right? Yeah. She went into every job she had with a kind of, how do I do this job? How do I understand this business? And then she has, as a bank founder, um, she's taken that same commitment to giving people opportunities to her employees. So she's the person now who's hiring the women who didn't finish their college degrees because they were raising families. She's giving them jobs now, and helping them learn a business you know, in the second, yeah. yeah, in the second chapter of their own lives, I love and it. that's that is just so Mason, you know. Yeah. But yeah, I'm glad you've noticed because that's that the storytelling on those window clings is is part of a set of things we're trying to do to lift up and make yeah. much more understandable purposeful to stories. Yeah. I mean, I thought like you know, be honest, like one of the things I had that chip on my shoulder too, you know, about being a history major, and I say it proud, but I'm like, you know, my life didn't, I had no clue my life was going to take me to yep. higher ed from history. I just studied something I really enjoyed and yep. got the best grades that I could to open up doors for grad school. But one of the things that also really drives me to share these stories and your story and liberal arts stories is like that networking event that we had at Mason where we purposely took away the job titles and only said their college degrees because we didn't want people to go up to people based on their college degrees. We want them to see the diversity of their majors. And based on that, you know the second largest attendee alumni-wise was chess. Yeah. And the second most attendee for students was chess. Yeah. And this need to like connect with alum and hear their stories. And hopefully we can do that again. But I think that's the, the main tone. I think the main one of the main strategies is really to demystify the liberal arts degree is that storytelling ability and showing that your major does not equal your career. Yep. You know, and, and really things. break away from that. Yeah, no, I think that was that was such a great event. And I think the other thing that you did that was brilliant at that event was help people think about the speed dating yeah. context of it, right? It's really hard to walk up to perfect strangers and and ask them to tell their stories and to tell your story, right? Yeah. Um, but the way you did it, um, the way you coached the whole audience on this is what's going to happen, and now you need to move to the next table. Um, it was it was designed like just and also just kudos define, to you for that. Thank yeah. you. And also just to find value that like if someone has a major that's not the same. The value, the main value, is their story, yeah. not the label. Yep. Like I could talk to someone that has a career major. I don't care. But what did what are the stories we put like leadership and all that stuff and the assertiveness like that young lady. There's stories outside of someone's degree that could be applicable. Yeah. That's really helpful. But that's the transferability of liberal arts skills. Yeah, I think you so. Know, yeah, it's, yeah. It's it's, yeah. it's not about, oh, I'm an anthropology major, I'm a German major, I'm an English major. Yeah. It's oh, I, I you know, I I know how to problem set and mm -hmm. problem solve. I listen well. I'm trying to think about how to let other people illuminate life experience, right? Not just mm -hmm. me talking at them, but giving people opportunities to tell their stories and then to be thinking through if there's a complex set of perspectives on something, how do you synthesize? How do mm -hmm. you... There's so many things we're never, ever going to all agree on yeah, that, right 100%. but how do you how do you move forward move toward consensus move toward compassionate community building yeah. right um you don't do it by saying oh you're a history major and i'm a political science major no. and i you know i don't need to talk to you because no. i'm this not that no there's applicability in interdisciplinary and then if you really think about it all our the the liberal arts degrees is supposed to be like such a cross you're supposed to have all these different subject matter experts yep. at the table. You know, like if I was studying, we had a project 
we need the one history person, we need the one philosophy person. We all like look at a problem from a different angle. And you know, yeah, and I would push it even a little bit more because it's like you're learning intellectual methodologies, mm -hmm. right? You're learning mental habits of behavior, yeah. right? And historians really do think differently and count different things as data yeah. than somebody in, in literary studies yeah. does, right? Yeah. But being able to talk through what that means, right? And yeah. to recognize, oh, this is why you, you approach this kind of thing this way. Mm -hmm. What counts as a fact? Um, and, and how do you demonstrate, you know, how do you prove something with different kinds of evidence mm -hmm. in different kinds of disciplines? Yeah. Um, so this has been great. I would like to talk forever, but I know you're got to respect your time. So this is the part of the show called Shot for Shot. You get to ask me any random question. I get to ask you any random question. You want to go first? I'll go first. I'll go first. What do you most enjoy about being a PhD student? <laughs> Taking a semester off. <laughs> um, no, honestly, I ain't gonna lie. I always like to learn. I think that if I can go to if I can go to school and just sit in classrooms and just do the classroom portion and discussion, I would do that. I, I, I ain't gonna lie. I just hate homework. I've always hated homework. That's never changed. I've always been someone that's like, on my own, I will read what I want to read. On my own, I'll watch a history documentary. Yeah. On my like, like. Maggie's like, my wife is like, you know, you're literally watching the History Channel or watching documentaries on your free time. I, I would, I love to learn history. I just don't want to be able to like write a paper on it, you know, like, and so with, with the, into, like, with the PhD program, I love my instructors. I love the reading. I actually really like the classroom and having to have dial. I love having discussions in class I just don't like work <laughs> like, and that's just that's never going to go away for me I, I was always that kid in class that uh if I was if I was all in I was all in but I was always told I talked too much yada 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 but um I, I love I love the pursuit of of education I love the pursuit of truth and using research and reading and dialogue and I also love like you just put perspective taking I love hearing from other people mm -hmm. and like oh i didn't think about it like that I, I love dialogue like i'm i'm always one to be like never so defensive mm -hmm. to like you know i got a few hills i'll die on but i love the the intellectual stimuli that we get from like oh you read that and you you mm -hmm. interpret it that way i read it this way wow like i we both now have a different way we looked at it together because we both through our two perspectives in. So I love that part. I, I, would, uh, I would audit classes. I'd be, I, I mean, I ain't going to tell you. Like, when I'm always going to take, I had like Grant, my dad does it, my, my father-in-law who passed away did it. I will always, Osher, I know that Osher thing. Mm -hmm. If I have my mind, if I always, if I have my mental capabilities, I'm always going to be taking a class. So. You can't Virginia, get rid of me. I'll be yep. here. Virginia law. I know that. Yeah. Over sixty. I know. Tuition they did it. Yeah, my dad. Yeah, my dad did it. My father-in-law. They did all it. They came here to Mason, and I'm like, that's it. Like, they're gonna have to like kick me off campus. I had a professor at George. I had a professor at James Madison that was legit. He taught till he died, meaning like he he was intellectually stimulated and taught a history class, and then he just kept on going as long as he was healthy. Mm -hmm. I was like, that could be me. I would love that. Get a ride to camp. Someone else can drive me. But that's something, part of my PhD program, but that's something that I'll always want to be like, as long as my mind is sharp, I want to be engaged. I want to be stimulated yeah, yeah. in my mind and talk and randomly be with young people. Maybe that would be cool. I'll be 80 years old with like 20-year-olds keeping me young. Like I also said this too. There's no way that technology is going to out, you know, like, like, I'm always like you know. I always look at people like I'm always gonna know how to use a computer. I'm a, like I'm always gonna use a phone. If they have robot, I'm always gonna stay up on it. There's yeah. I'm never gonna be asking my kids to help me with technology. I'm gonna mentally I'm gonna stay up on it. So have you played with Chat GPT? Oh yeah, of course. I, I'm playing with all that stuff. Okay. But I'm just saying like there's no way that I don't get scared about technology. I play like I'm gonna stay ahead of it. You know I'm gonna I'm gonna know how to use. 80 years old, I'm still gonna play video games. You know what I'm saying? So. <laughs> like, but that's that's the part I like. All right, my question for you: English. All right, um, 
What has been one of your favorite literary books that you read for pleasure? And, you know, a book, poem, book, whatever, uh, a literary work. What literature has been one of your favorite, you know, as a person, not for profession, not to study, but as a person has been one of your favorites? I'm going to refuse to answer that question because I keep reading and I keep not having, like, single favorites. Um, I, I love it. Okay, Dennis Frank, what is your current, you're rocking with it right now? Uh, I just finished reading uh, Knife. Do you know, um, did, did you ever read Midnight's Children, Solomon Rushdie's book? Is he the one to make movies? No. Um, he he was the one who got um, stabbed at Chautauqua. Okay. Um, yeah. Yes, yeah. Uh, it's, it's a memoir about his experience of recovering from that. Um, I finished that yesterday, and I started reading. Uh, do you know Zadie Smith's work? I started reading N.W., which is her. It's a book about Londoners. Um, so I, my time off is, is reading. Is reading. Do you yeah. crank through books real fast? Um, it all depends on what time of the academic year it is, because okay. you know I happen to be able to like. You know, read for more than three minutes. Um, gotcha. You know, yeah. Before falling asleep. Uh, you know, I, I'm not. A, I'm always been a terrible reader, and not like mean terrible. Like I'm slow. So my my wife my processes is audio. Mm. I listen to audio books. I, li- I mean, I retain stuff. My wife says your audio like she's like your visual memory and spatial awareness is trash. And I'm like okay, but like I can listen to something and hear it like three times if I hear it. It's in. It's locked. And see, I'm the, I need to see it written in order to remember it. No, I can. I remember. Now I'll remember lots of stuff about your story. As I said, I remember stuff from these podcasts. But well, that's great. So knife and all those. Okay. Well, this is the part of the show called shout outs and plugs. So you get to show love to anyone you want to show love to. And then plugs. These are things that you would like me to put in the show notes. I put in the website. I'll put. I'll make sure to put in the website and all the resources for uh, chess, but any other things you want to highlight. So shout outs and plugs. Shout out to my 94-year-old mom. Shout out to your 94-year-old mom. She will be 95 in September, and she is one amazing kind of, she's just amazing. There it is. And then plugs, what are some things you'd want the listeners to be aware of going on in chest or whatever? I would want people to set the negative optics on okay. a college education aside um, and give themselves the pleasure of listening to people's stories about the world of work that people have had all kinds of different experiences in because they had a four-year degree. Excellent. Well, I'm definitely going to put all the resources related to this college in the show notes for those to explore. Also, you know, like I said, I'm team chess right now because they they, they got me on board. But uh, definitely, if you have any questions about that or Mason, feel free to reach out. As you know, every episode is dedicated to the memory of my late father-in-law, Jeff Kirsch. So please consider donating to the Jeff Kirsch Anti-Hunger Fund for all his work uh, fighting food insecurity. As well as if you're a Mason Nation uh, patriot, please consider submitting a patch for Patriot to elevate or, you know, make someone's day. And also, please uh, like, subscribe, you know, share this episode, give this rating, give this episode or podcast a rating or review. It helps elevate the podcast. But thank you so much for listening, and we're out. Thank you for listening to Positive Filter, a podcast that focuses on family, friends, career, with a little self-help along the way. If you enjoyed this podcast, please share it with your family and friends, and like the Facebook page, Spreading Positivity of Movement. Thanks for listening.